Okay, so ready to like dive into some seriously interesting stuff. I'm ready when you are. Awesome. So today we're doing a deep dive into chapter two of research methodology. And let me tell you, this isn't just some boring ethics lecture. Oh, definitely not. We're talking scandals, dilemmas, the whole shebang. Because understanding research ethics, you know, it's important for everyone, not just the scientists out there. Absolutely. It's about making sure we can trust the results we see and, most importantly, making sure no one gets harmed in the process. And to really get why this is so important, we need to take a look back, you know, at some of those darker moments in research history. Yeah, for sure. Like the Tuskegee syphilis study. Man, that one still gives me chills. Yeah, th that's a perfect example. That study, it ran for decades and they actually withheld treatment from a group of African-American men who had syphilis even after effective treatments like became available. It's just ugh, awful. Yeah, it's a truly horrifying example of how those ethical violations, they can have really devastating and long lasting impacts. Yeah. And it's not just a history lesson either. Right. Like the mistrust that came from Tuskegee, it still impacts healthcare participation today, especially in marginalized communities. Sadly, you're absolutely right. And that's why ethical research, it's not just about avoiding harm. It's about building trust, too. And it's things like that, like the Tuskegee study that led to things like the National Research Act and the creation of institutional review boards or <laughs> IRBs. But like IRBs are like the ethics police of the research world. Kind of. Yeah. Think of them like um, safety inspectors, but for research projects. Mm -hmm. So they review all those study proposals to check for any potential risks, make sure that everyone involved knows what they're getting into with informed consent and weigh the benefits of the research against any ethical concerns. It's really a reminder that we can't just assume that researchers are always going to make the ethical choice, you know. Right, right. And those choices, they can get really complicated. Speaking of complicated, we can't talk about ethical research without bringing up the Nuremberg Code, can we? Definitely not. It's super important. Like 10 points that came out of, you know, those horrific Nazi medical experiments during World War II. It's heavy stuff. Absolutely, yeah. Voluntary consent, weighing those risks against the benefits, and of course, avoiding unnecessary suffering these principles they're at the core of ethical research even today and it's well they came at a terrible cost for sure and it just makes you realize how crucial it is to have those ethical guidelines in place but even with guidelines navigating those gray areas of ethics in research man it can be tricky like take the whole debate about deception in research is it ever okay to lie to participants if it's in the name of science? Yeah, that's a tough one. That's where those different philosophical approaches come in. You know, so you've got the utilitarian approach, right? That <laughs> might say, okay, maybe a little white lie is okay if it leads to some huge scientific breakthrough that benefits everyone. It's all about that cost-benefit analysis. But then, of course, you've got the deontological perspective, which is like, nope, lying is wrong, end of story. Right, exactly. A deontologist would say that some things, like deceiving someone, are never okay no matter what even if it leads to those groundbreaking discoveries. Man, that's a tough one. It's like you're stuck in this ethical tug of war between, you know, advancing knowledge and respecting individual rights. Yeah, and there's no easy answer, unfortunately. Every research scenario has its own set of ethical considerations. But that's why having that open dialogue, you know, and thinking critically about these things is so crucial in research. I'm with you on that. Okay, so let's say a researcher They've thought about all the ethical stuff, gotten the IRB's blessing, and they're ready to start recruiting participants. What are some of those ethical landmines that they might trip over during that whole process? Well, one really common example is using college students in research. Yeah. While they're, you know, convenient and usually pretty willing to participate, there's this inherent pair dynamic there that you can't ignore. Oh, tell me about it. I remember those participate or your grade suffers moments back in my college days. Exactly. And even when they say it's optional, there's still that underlying pressure, especially if the professor running the study is the one giving the grades. You know, that's why making sure they have actual informed consent is so important. Meaning the students have to know exactly what they're signing up for and that nothing bad will happen if they choose not to do it. Exactly. A hundred percent. And that whole thing about voluntary participation and making sure people aren't being pressured that doesn't just stop at college campuses. Think about research that's done with employees at a company. That power dynamic just gets even more, well, intense. Right, because it's like, how are you going to say no to your boss if they ask you to be in a research study? Even if they say it's voluntary, it's hard to feel like you have a choice. Totally, and that pressure just blows informed consent right out of the water. And then you've got those extra layers of confidentiality to navigate 
in workplace research, especially when you're dealing with sensitive info. You can't have people worried that their answers are going to end up on their boss's desk. So then how do you deal with that? Is anonymity like the magic solution? Anonymity can help for sure, but it's not always possible or even the best thing for what the research is trying to find out. Sometimes you need to see how people's answers change over time or connect different sets of data. But even when you can't be anonymous, there are ways to keep things confidential. Like, I don't know, using codes instead of names or making sure that data is stored securely. Exactly. Hmm. And being totally upfront with the people participating about how their information is going to be used yeah. and, more importantly, protected. Transparency is key. But speaking of transparency, let's talk about that whole deception and research thing again. It sometimes seems like you need it, you know? Like, how can you study certain behaviors without being a bit, well, sneaky? Right, and that's where it gets really ethically tricky. The researchers, they really need to weigh the potential benefits of what they're studying against the potential harm of, you know, not being totally honest with their participants. And the harm isn't just about the lie itself, right? It's about the damage it can do to trust, not just in that one researcher, but in research as a whole. You're absolutely right. That deception, it can have a ripple effect. That's why it should only be used as a last resort. And only when there's really no other way to get the answers and the potential benefits are big enough to justify the ethical cost. And even then, there are still those strict rules, right? Like always telling the participants the truth afterward. Absolutely. Debriefing is crucial. Mm. It's about coming clean, telling them why that deception was needed, and giving the participants a chance to ask questions and process the whole thing. So hopefully they leave feeling like they weren't tricked, but that they were part of something important, even if it wasn't exactly what they thought it was at the beginning. Right, exactly. Ethical research is about respecting the people who participate, especially when things are ethically complicated. Absolutely. Speaking of complicated, let's switch gears here and talk about what happens after you have all the data, you know, the reporting phase. Ah, uh, yes, because the ethics stuff, it doesn't just disappear once the data is collected. It's just as crucial during the reporting phase. Yeah, because what's the point of doing everything ethically if you're just going to mess with the findings at the end? Yeah, you hit the nail on the head there. If you're cutting corners in the reporting, you're really undermining the whole point of doing ethical research in the first place. Totally. It's like a huge breach of trust. We're talking about like tweaking data to fit your hypothesis, mm -hmm. only showing the results that tell the story you want, or even, you know, just plain making stuff up. And unfortunately, that stuff happens. Like, remember that whole vaccine and autism thing? Oh, yeah. How could I forget? So back in 1998, there was this study published in a really well-respected medical journal that linked the MMR vaccine to autism. Yeah, I remember that. It caused such a huge panic. And for good reason, right. <laughs> but then later on, that study was totally retracted. Turns out the lead researcher had manipulated the data. Wow. Seriously. So like, what happened to him? What are the consequences when someone commits that kind of research misconduct? Oh, they can be huge. That researcher, he lost his license to practice medicine, and I think it was completely justified. But even beyond that, this kind of stuff just erodes the public's trust in science, you know? It can have a real chilling effect on research. It's a good reminder that even in a field that's all about objectivity, people make mistakes. And, well, sometimes they just straight up lie. And it's not always about outright fraud either, is it? There are subtler ways to misrepresent research. For sure, yeah. Like selectively reporting data, downplaying any limitations in the study, or even burying findings that don't really fit the story you're trying to tell. Those are all forms of misrepresentation. Definitely. And it's not just about the data itself either. Transparency is so important when it comes to authorship too. You know, who gets credit and how that credit is giving out, that's a big deal in the research world. Yeah, absolutely. Figuring out authorship, it can get kind of messy, especially when you've got a bunch of researchers collaborating. The order of the authors on a paper, it matters. It affects things like funding, career advancement, even just how much impact people think their research will have. So how do you make sure that whole process is handled ethically? Open communication is key right from the get-go. Everyone involved needs to be on the same page about their roles, what they contributed, and how authorship will be determined. So there are no surprises or arguments later down the line. Makes sense. But what about when you have research that spans multiple institutions or even crosses international borders? Oh, yeah. Then things get even more complicated. Now you're dealing with different rules, cultural norms, maybe even conflicting interests. That sounds like a recipe for, well, maybe not disaster, but definitely some ethical challenges. Totally. Like who owns the data? 
How will it be shared? Are there any conflicts of interest? All of that needs to be worked out in a way that's fair and transparent. It really shows how important it is to have those open conversations all throughout the research process. It seems like communication is key in all of this. Communication between the researchers themselves, between researchers and participants, between institutions. Couldn't agree more. And hey, let's not forget those institutional review boards, the IRBs we talked about earlier. Oh, right. They're not just there to like review the study at the beginning and then they're done. Exactly. They have a role throughout the entire process. They monitor the research as it's happening, handle any ethical issues that pop up, and make sure the researchers are sticking to those ethical standards we've been talking about. Yep. And this isn't limited to universities either. Right. It's any research that involves humans, yep. right? No matter if it's in a lab, a company, or even online. You got it. Ethical research isn't tied to a specific place or field. It's about being committed to integrity and respecting everyone involved. It's about doing the right thing, even when it's tough. Speaking of tough, let's talk about the wild west of research. The internet. Oh yeah. Online research, it comes with its own whole set of ethical dilemmas. It really does, yeah. Like platforms like Amazon Mechanical Turk, M Turk, they call it. It's changed how we collect data. Yeah. But there are definitely some ethical things to consider. Because it's so easy to be anonymous online, right? People can lie about who they are or what their qualifications are and end up in studies they shouldn't be in. Exactly. And that yeah. can really mess with the findings. And then there's the issue of making sure online workers are being paid fairly, that their privacy is being protected, and that they're not being taken advantage of. Just because it's online, it doesn't mean ethics go out the window. Totally. It seems like the digital age has really thrown a wrench into research ethics. How are we supposed to even start navigating all these new challenges? It's a combination of things. We need to adapt the ethical guidelines we already have so they make sense in these new online settings. But we also need entirely new frameworks for online research. So how do we make sure those ethical research practices are actually happening in the online world, which is constantly changing, by the way? What can researchers do? It starts with awareness. They need to be aware of the ethical challenges that are unique to online research. So it's like we're trying to fit this square peg of traditional ethics into the round hole of online research, and it's just not always a clean fit. What are some things researchers can do, like, practically to make sure they're doing online research responsibly? Well, it all starts with awareness. You know, mm. researchers really need to get a handle on the ethical challenges that come with doing research online because it's a whole different ballgame. Take informed consent, for example. Yeah, good point. In the online world, it takes on a whole new meaning. Because like clicking agree on those terms of service agreements that nobody actually reads, that's not exactly what I call informed consent. You got it. Researchers have to be crystal clear about what the study is about, what the risks and benefits are for the people taking part, and how that data, especially if it's sensitive, will be used and kept safe. And this is all especially important online. And it's not just about, you know, keeping the participants safe, but also making sure that the research itself holds up, right? You're absolutely right, yeah. The fact that it's so easy to be anonymous online, well, it, it makes it easier for people to lie about who they are, and that can really skew the results. Researchers have got to be smart about how they find people online. And yeah, sometimes that means verifying identities. And what about paying people for their time online? It seems like there's a lot of room for exploitation there. There definitely is. It's a big deal to make sure that people are getting paid fairly for their time and effort. Groups like the American Psychological Association, they actually have guidelines for online research ethics, including suggestions for fair pay. That's good to hear. It seems like doing online research right is kind of a balancing act. You know, you got to be aware of the needs and vulnerabilities of the people participating while also sticking to those high standards of research. Absolutely. You said it perfectly. It's all about constantly thinking, adapting and working together. The researchers, the IRBs, even the websites themselves, they all need to collaborate to figure out the ethical norms and best practices for the online research world. It really highlights how ethical research isn't just about like checking boxes and following rules, but having these ongoing conversations, adapting to new challenges and, you know, just trying to do right by the people who make research possible in the first place. I couldn't have said it better myself. Yeah. And that's where you, the listener, come in. Yeah. Because even if we're not researchers ourselves, we're all consuming research in one way or another. Think about it. Whether you're reading a news article, scrolling through your feed, or even just talking about a new study with a friend, you're encountering research findings all the time. And it's up to all of us 
to engage with that information in a way that's both critical and ethical. So like, what does that actually look like day to day? Start asking questions. Where did this info come from? Mm -hmm. Who did the research? Were there any biases or conflicts of interest? What were the limitations of the study? So basically, don't just take things at face value. Dig a little deeper. Yes, exactly. And just because a study was published in a big name journal or reported on by a source you usually trust, that doesn't mean it was done ethically. Good point. It's easy to just accept those findings without thinking, but we need to stop and think about how that information was gathered and if it was presented responsibly. Exactly. And if something feels off, don't be afraid to say something. Ask questions, bring up your concerns, and demand transparency. Because at the end of the day, being ethical in research, it's something we're all responsible for. Well said. By having these conversations, asking the tough questions, and expecting better from researchers and institutions, we can help shape a future where knowledge is pursued ethically and responsibly. A win for science and society. Love it. Well, folks, it looks like we've reached the surface on this deep dive into research ethics. Hopefully you're swimming away with a better grasp of the key principles, some of those tricky dilemmas, and most importantly, why it's so essential to approach research with that critical ethical lens. It's fascinating stuff and incredibly important. Couldn't agree more. Until next time, everyone, keep those ethical antennas up and happy deep diving.